What we're going to look at in this module are global wind patterns and air pressure. We've talked about how energy travels from the sun to the earth in the form of radiation. So we have that coming to the earth where it's absorbed by our surface. Now the equator is going to get more direct sunlight than anything else. So the temperatures right around here are going to be higher than anything else. So what happens is this air rises and moves towards the poles where it sinks and moves back towards the equator. Same thing happens in the southern hemisphere. The air rises, moves towards the poles where it sinks and moves back towards the equator. So we get these global wind cells. Now that's all nice and neat, but while this is happening, the earth is spinning. So it gets to be just a little bit more complicated than that. What we see is something called the Coriolis effect. So the Coriolis effect has to do with the Earth's rotation. So let's say that the Earth is spinning in this direction. Now, if you are in an airplane, while you are in the air, the Earth is still spinning. So let's say that you are at the North Pole and you want to fly to a location right here on the equator. Now, if you fly in a straight line, you're not going to hit your target. And the reason is because while you were in the air, the Earth has rotated. So if you wanted to hit your target, you would actually have to curve your flight pattern. And that way you would get to where you needed to go. Now anything that is not attached to the Earth, so our, our winds, our air in the atmosphere, water in the ocean, is going to appear to curve to anyone that is on the surface. So when we look at our global wind patterns, we're going to see something a little bit more complicated in this. And I'll show you a slide that has a picture of what our wind patterns actually look like. You can see here that it's not as simple as the model that we first illustrated. We have multiple cells. Instead of just having heat rising here, moving towards the poles, where it sinks and moves back towards the equator, we have multiple cells. Um, because of the Coriolis effect, as we saw that winds in our northern hemisphere move in a clockwise direction, winds in the southern hemisphere curve in a counterclockwise direction. Because of this movement, we also see pressure differences in between each cell. The second thing we're going to look at today is air pressure. We have air pressure differences based on whether the air is sinking towards the surface or if it's rising in the atmosphere. Now at the equator where temperatures are the warmest, that warm air is going to rise. When warm air rises, it's going to carry any moisture with it. As it rises in the atmosphere, we know that in the troposphere as you rise temperatures decrease, the water vapor is going to condense and form clouds. So usually when we have low pressure, you're going to see um, it's going to be overcast, you're going to have precipitation, and we know that that warm air, after it rises, it moves, and when air sinks, we get high pressure. And the reason is you've got the weight of that air pushing down, so it's going to carry any moisture down with it. So if we have high pressure, we have clear skies, no clouds, no precipitation. So when you're looking at a weather map and you see the big H's and the L's, that stands for high and low pressure. And you can determine that at low pressure, it's going to tend to be cloudy, possible precipitation. High pressure, it's going to be sunny and clear. Now air always moves from high to low pressure. So when that happens on Earth's surface, it creates wind. Um, the higher the pressure difference, the faster the wind speed you will see. So if we go back and look at our global winds once again, uh, you'll see that where we have um, low pressure and air rising, we have convergence, where the high pressure air moves in. Where we have air sinking for high pressure, we have divergence, where the winds are moving in opposite directions. And we'll talk about this again later on in the week when we look at weather patterns and weather maps and how to predict, we can determine the wind direction based on where the pressure centers are. Wherever air is rising, that creates low pressure. When the air rises, it carries any moisture with it, which can condense and form precipitation. 
So in our areas of low pressure, we have converging air. These are called the trade winds that converge at the equator. Then we see it rise and start to move north and south of the equator where it starts to sink. All right, here we have sinking air, we have high pressure. Most of our desert biomes are right along this high pressure line. And what happens here when you have sinking air, that moist air can't rise and form clouds, so we have very little precipitation. The air around this subtropical high diverges. And you can see you've got um, some air moving back towards the equator. You have some air that's moving towards the pole. Between the next cells, we have another low pressure area where those air, um, where those wind belts converge and rise. And then once again, at the poles, we have a low pressure. Going back to look at this diagram again, uh, I mentioned the trade winds that converge at the equator. Um, these Above the subtropical high, we have what are called westerlies and then our polar easterlies. We name winds based on the direction that they come from, not where they're going. So if they're blowing from west to east, we call them westerlies. Above the troposphere, in the lower part of the stratosphere, we have um, what is called a jet stream. Um, and it drives the weather patterns down in the troposphere. So the jet streams form in between those wind cells that we saw in the last slide. The one that goes across the United States goes west to east. And you can see it kind of dips down. So when we are making weather predictions, all the weather patterns move from west to east across the United States. We'll see our fronts, our storms, our precipitation, everything moves in that pattern. And that really helps meteorologists when they're trying to make weather predictions when you're looking out at like seven day and 10 day forecasts. So looking at this weather map, um, you might have seen something like this on a weather forecast. This one comes from weather.com. Um, you can see areas that have low pressure, and we know that that's usually, you're going to have overcast skies, maybe some precipitation. Our H's are high pressure centers, um, where you're going to have clear sky, sunny conditions. And because we know the jet stream moves west to east, we know that these are going to move um, west to east as well. And sometimes we get that dip in the jet stream that moves in this direction. These are fronts. Um, the Blue with the triangles are cold fronts, and this cold front is moving. You can look at the direction the arrows are pointing. It's mo moving towards the southeast. And we know because of the pattern of the jet stream, it's probably going to start moving southeast and curve back up towards the northeast. Um, also, when we think about the jet stream, if you've ever flown from the east coast to the west, you've probably noticed that a flight from North Carolina to California takes a little bit longer than it takes to fly from California back. The same thing if you're flying to the northeast, it's going to be a quicker flight there and a much slower flight back when you're flying against the jet stream.